Mysteries of the Mind with me, your host, Sarah Soderland. So thankful that you're joining me. For those of you who are new to the show, shame on you, but thank you for tuning in. Um, Maybe you were referred by a friend. Maybe you are lingering over from the Situation Room, which is always hot about politics and things in the news. I love it because you get a worldly perspective. Um, But then we kind of meld over into Mysteries of the Mind, and it's a lot about you. It's a lot about what you think. So now you've been listening to the Situation Room, you're fired up, you've got your thoughts, your theories, your philosophies, you know, you kind of have this idea of what's going on in your mind, but you're not always sure how you got there. Were you just agreeing with someone? Did you watch a political documentary and it changed your perspective? Maybe you listened to the Situation Room and John Ward was particularly charming and you found yourself on the yes train. Were you maybe a victim of psychopathy or charm or even hypnosis? A form of neurolinguistics, this very fantastic sensual dance done between people on an unconscious level, just talking about language alone, which is what I love because here we are on the radio, right? Using technology to connect my mouth to your ears. There's this connection, this intimate conversation that we're having as I narrate you through kind of these thought processes. And what I love is this idea that It was our mind that created the computer, this medium to utilize energy and transfer thought. But we can do it telepathically as well. And we're doing so many things unconsciously. Our our breathing, our pace, our gestures, our hands, the way that we guide a conversation or lead an interaction if I'm watching a presenter at some great event, like maybe the Paradigm Symposium coming up here this October uh, in Minnesota, seeing all these speakers from all over the world talk about their passion and their research. And of course, you pay attention to the PowerPoint, and of course, you're listening to their voice, getting a sense of who they are. But you're also taking in information. What clothes are they wearing? How are they moving? Their eye contact. Their ability to change and move and keep pace, to respond to questions, to lead a group. Are they people people? You know, are they good communicators? Do they establish trust with you right away or rapport? Some of these people speak for a living. So, of course, those are things that they're taught to know how to do well. And it's kind of funny sometimes how often we give up control. Maybe you think to yourself, Ugh, I don't really like to give up control. That doesn't feel very good. I like to be in control, right? But think about billboards and advertisements, radio ads, the occasional slip-in from Pandora, the Google ads on the side in your peripheral, all of the receipts on the back of your coupons, Just everything that's bombarding you constantly that you're unconsciously feeding into the mind. That maybe you don't even have control over. (laughs) You know, you're just going to Target, man. You need to pick up some paper towels. But suggestions were fed to you along the way from McDonald's, from the local LASIK billboard that you drive past. Whatever it is that might be coming to mind right now, that advertisement you see every day when you leave your house that billboard that you think about. Synchronicity. Man, that's a part of your life. (laughs) It inserted itself in there without your permission. And it's in your thoughts. Advertising is very interesting. And we give up control to advertising when it's easy, when it's an easy process. And that's a really important thing to be able to establish during an assessment with someone and for you and I to establish right now about you how you assess your control are you a controlling person because if you are I don't know maybe you're a visual person so you're visualizing this duality this linear graph in your mind this Donnie Darko image of love and fear 
this spectrum of emotion. And control for you is something that you need. Or is it just something that you want? Think about conversations. Do you prefer to be the active listener or do you prefer to be talking? Do you have the gift of gab? Well, depending on how you answered that, you kind of have to ask the next question. It not only goes into communication, but when you walk into a room, a crowded room, an old friend throwing a party, you don't quite know everyone there, how do you feel? What's your anxiety level? When you are a speaker at an event and you walk out on stage, how do you feel knowing that you suddenly are leading a conversation? So through an interview or through an assessment process, as I'm asking you these questions, and we're kind of learning more about you. I'm learning your pace. I'm learning how you respond. I'm learning if your body language is going to change if I slow down or if I speed up. I'm going to establish how much control you like to have in a conversation by mirroring your body language, making eye contact more than usual. You can be flirtatious or not flirtatious and start to assess how much um, arousal plays into the communicative process. And the assessment becomes this dance, really. And control is very important. Control for many of us, if we go to that file in our mind, so we're going to right click on our start and go over to the computer and double click there and we're looking at all of these folders. We're seeing all of these things in our mind that we didn't necessarily put it there, but maybe it's genetic, maybe it's conditioned, who knows, but we double click that folder and there are just folders there. We can't change them all. Some of them are just a read-only, you know. Some of them we need to operate, at least right now. And when you look at control in your mind, what do you see? What do you feel? What is it that you're hearing play back in your mind? Where does control show itself in your life? I'll give you an example. For me, um, I'm kind of always thinking of psychological assessments because that's what I do for a living. And I'm kind of always thinking about the assessment process. Biological, physiological, psychological, emotional, sexual. All of these <laughs> logical words. <laughs> and listing things that you might think are common sense, but it's that being mindful. It seems like common sense, but let's list them anyway. Let's get it down on paper. Let's take it from potential energy to kinetic. Let's build a momentum and get something going here for change, for perspective. Take it from being inside your mind in one of those folders. Let it travel through the vocal cords and through the body and communicate it to someone and see how they interpret the information and what ideas they might have, what feedback they might give. And even to read it back to yourself gives you an instant change in perspective, which is why journaling is so healthy. But control, we do associate with our sex life. We associate it with how we communicate with others. We have a comfortable scale, what makes us uncomfortable and what doesn't where that puts us in a job or a career. You know, can we work well with others? Can we do minimal tasks over and over? Do we have to be creative? Do we need to be in control? Is it difficult to take orders from someone who's younger than you? I mean, you have all of these things that come into play and control sometimes can be the seed for an assessment. So today's topic is domestic violence. <clears throat> And we're going to talk a little bit about this because everybody has some type of an experience with domestic violence. And you also already have a definition in your mind of what that is. And it's completely based on your experience. And that's normal. 
and that's healthy and that's what every other human being is doing from language to language generation to generation culture to culture domestic violence means something different so what does that mean for you we're gonna talk a little bit more about it and we're gonna leave that definition open maybe maybe you can kind of highlight it in your mind and note it maybe maybe we can change the definition maybe we can even change how you feel about that word because for some people they associate domestic violence with a lack of control maybe they're a victim maybe they're a perpetrator either way control really comes into play and so as we talk more about that in today's show I'm interested in your perception I'm interested for those of you joining us live at Intrepid Radio um, in the chat room you can ask questions and we can kind of explore together because that's what this is about this is about your mind and so I really want to hear what it is you're experiencing so maybe it's a news article maybe you have a third degree separation Maybe you're reading an article. This topic really hit home for me today. I avoided posting and ended up late because I honestly didn't even want to write this. Maybe in the future, but not now. My daughter's best friend is in this article. At one point, we lived in San Pedro. This is where she became best friends with Algernon. After we moved, they remained in touch. He's like a son to me and a brother to my daughter. He even visited us. They lost contact for months at a time, but they would always get in touch with one another, talking as if no time had passed. Until June 5, 2015. My daughter received a text while we were driving to my hometown, and all of a sudden we saw a wanted poster. <laughs> we thought it was a joke. What'd he do? Kill his wife? Well, we looked it up on the internet. We couldn't believe it was true. He was wanted for capital murder. He's accused of killing his wife and infant son. It was shocking. The article won't tell you what I know. However, it does give an idea, based on a neighbor, of what his marriage was like. I guess I chose this story because it's personal and because this marriage had every red flag listed for domestic violence. So this was a past client and colleague of mine who wrote this post. And I remember thinking how important this was because for her, her perspective of domestic violence was a separation perspective. But that's not what it was for me. And it's not what it's always been for the clients I've worked with. For example, I worked at a woman's treatment center here in Minnesota. And frequently, the women that were coming in, drug overdoses, trying to get clean for the court system, for the foster care system, whatever their reason. Maybe they were forced, maybe they were volunteer. But usually they were a victim of domestic violence. And so when people use that word around work frequently over and over on a daily basis, it meant violence against women. And I tried not to let that perception change me, and I don't believe that it did, because even now, listening to my peer post this, um, post this week, I still think about my experiences. Because oftentimes, control is a core belief. So if you're either a victim or a perpetrator of something like domestic violence or physical violence, violence is unique. Violence is very penetrating. And it can be very traumatic. So when we associate it with things like post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety disorders, um, mental illnesses that really um, struggle if intervention and help and treatment isn't given, are usually related to violence. And it doesn't have to be a victim of violence. It can be a perpetrator of violence. It can be a witness to violence. So again, in my experience, domestic violence didn't mean violence against women. It meant violence at home. Because see, for me, the violent perpetrator in my life was my mom. 
she was extremely violent and she would beat my dad all the time. And I remember my sister and I handling it and coping with it in completely different ways. My sister would often kind of recluse into her room and bury her nose in a Terry Brooks novel and be writing stories. And I was usually sitting on the staircase chiming in and picking, you know, standing up for my dad or screaming at my mom to be quiet. And um, I was very much like my mom from a very young age, very willing to step forward, very extroverted, uh, not socially shy by any means, and in the past quite tactless. My mom never really cared much for what other people thought. She was always very bold. So for me, um, until I was nine, ten years old, domestic violence was a woman. It was a redheaded woman that was instigated by alcohol and drugs and who was a professional singer and everyone loved her and everyone thought she was the coolest and the best. But my sister and I played rock, paper, scissors to wake her up in the morning or to make sure that she was still breathing. <laughs> this was not someone that we wanted to mess with. And... Um, so domestic violence was violence against men. And it was a first-hand experience. And then my mother um, went through a very hairy divorce. And she had an affair with one particular man that seemed to be the one she stuck with after the divorce was uh, complete. And he, ironically, was an extremely abusive man. She went from someone like my father, who was very passive, to going through a very traumatic divorce, and then ending up in this relationship that was very self-destructive. And this man would take it to the limit and then push it some. And he was very, very abusive. And so then domestic violence changed. It wasn't just a red-headed woman who I occasionally called mom. It was Mike. And it was Mike until I was 15. And he beat me pretty badly. And the police finally got involved and the process changed. But then we learn about domestic violence. Man, are you a first hand witness? Are you a second hand witness? Are you a victim? Are you a perpetrator? And when does that cycle change? Because we do know it's cyclical. Somehow control and stability, it changes within who we are. And risk factors for being a victim morph into red flags, what we call in the mental health world, for domestic violence. And there are some things that, again, are just very common sense. But once we start to illustrate them and find them, so it's kind of like we're doing a control F and we're looking in the backlogs of our computer here. We're digging in our mind. We're going to look up red flags for domestic violence. We've kind of established our perspective, what experiences we might have. And we're going to take it even closer. We're going to take it even farther. We're going to take it even deeper. But first, you're going to have a moment. We're going to take a break. So before we go a little bit deeper into the red flags and into your history of domestic violence, we're going to take a break here on Intrepid Radio from Mysteries of the Mind with me, your host, Sarah Soderland, and we'll take it even deeper after the break. Patrick Sullivan. I'm a boxer and a Guinness drinker. Now it's come to my attention that you lads in America only drink Guinness on special occasions. So let me tell you about this special occasion that finds me drinking a pint of Guinness. I was fighting Michael the Hammer Halleck when the referee stopped the fight in the fourth round due to excessive bleeding. As the referee led poor Hammer, covered in blood, to his corner, all I could think about was I was going to win for the first time in 57 professional fights. However, the referee soon made the discovery that it was my blood covering old Hammer. And what can I say? 
I'm a bleeder by nature. Now you might be thinking, oh, and 57 is not much of a special occasion. And that's my point exactly. You can drink Guinness any day. Sure, it's dark, but it drinks smooth and easy. You may even find it refreshes your spirit. So don't be so precious with your pints. Grab a Guinness, because it's good to drink. Guinness Stout, imported by Guinness Bass Import Company, Stanford, Connecticut. Oh, and if you think the Irish only bleed Kelly Green, just come to one of my fights. When we make Beyond Natural Dry Dog and Cat Foods, we start with real meat as the first ingredient. We leave out corn, wheat, and soy. And we own where our dry food is made. 100%. Can other brands say all that? For nutrition you can trust and your pet will enjoy. Does your food go beyond? Learn more at PurinaBeyond.com. Are you looking for a really awesome and amazing graphic designer? How about an illustrator or a photographer? This is Rainy Roberts, and I wanted to tell you how you can get my designer, illustrator husband, Scotty Roberts, to work for you on your project. Do you have an awesome self-published book but no cover, or even worse, a cover that really sucks? Do you need a kick-ass logo for your company or some f***ing awesome graphic designs for your ads or website? Then get in touch with my husband for the best f***ing awesome kick-ass design and illustration he knows his stuff and he's been at this for more years than i've been alive go to scottallenroberts.com that's scott with two t's a-l-a-n-r-o-b-e-r-t-s.com to take a look at his online portfolio of work or call 651-468-8115 now go out and kick some ass with some kick-ass graphic design hire my dad so he can take me to disneyland The fourth annual Paradigm Symposium will again be bridging the gap in Minneapolis, Minnesota, this October 1st through the 4th. The Paradigm Symposiums were founded and exist to present you year after year with the very best thinkers in their fields. From ancient cosmology to ancient aliens, archaeology to esoterics, alternative history to the sciences that illuminate our understanding of who we are and why we're here. Randall Carlson, Richard Dolan, Peter Robbins, Rita Louise, John Ward, Micah Hanks, and Barry Fitzgerald, along with several other phenomenal names in their fields, will be presenting at the Paradigm Symposium 2015, held at the Crown Plaza Hotel, Mall of America in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Get your tickets now for what will be another amazing, inspiring Paradigm Symposium. For tickets, go to ParadigmSymposium.com. Welcome back, everyone, to Intrepid Radio. This is Mysteries of the Mind with Sarah Soderland. So excited you're joining me. And before the break, we were getting comfortable and kind of exploring. And man, I don't think I share too much because I I do try and take it to an intimate level because I want to talk about intimacy and control. And that's what our topic is today, is domestic violence and how you define that and where it is in your mind and what perspective that you have if it's negative, if it's positive, if it's kinesthetic, if it's audio, do you, do you hear abuse? Were you a victim? Were you a perpetrator? I mean, oftentimes we are both. And I was going to talk about that cycle and that ironic cycle and um, share with you even further how that cycle continued for me. <clears throat> um, for those of you listening, this is an exciting opportunity to kind of experience your perspective of domestic violence. You know, it started out for me from my mom, and I was a witness to it. Then it started off from there, moving into kind of a co-ed experience. My mother and I were often the victim from my stepfather, but then there were some weekends where it would be my stepfather and my mom, and I would be the victim. 
And that went on for some time. And then there was this very rebellious stage that you often see with juveniles, as we call them in forensic psychology, but adolescents or teenagers or kids or children. But you um, sometimes find yourself going through this very rebellious phase where comfort for you and stability for you haven't been well established. And so you do feel a little chaotic inside and you're desperate to find an identity and to find an anchor and to find a comfort. For some people, that means they're very promiscuous. For some people, that means that they are very uh, dangerous adrenaline junkies. Maybe they engage in street racing or street fighting or gang behavior or vandalism. Um, It kind of extends to a lot of deviant behavior because it's about being bad. You know, you somehow associate in your mind that attention, the showing of emotion, the communication even, was mostly screaming and yelling and fighting. And where a healthy, quote-unquote, healthy family, maybe you find yourself at the dinner table and someone's screaming at each other that you feel uncomfortable, someone who's been in that environment since they were a child, they find that to be comfortable. And so they create chaos. They become very self-destructive. And I was no different. Okay. I did a lot of street racing was my thing. And I, man, I was in boxing and I did a lot of competitive sports and I was on an indoor soccer team and just blew people's elbows out. Blammo. You know, and I just enjoyed it and, um, was very competitive, was, you know, wanted to be the best of the best of the best. And that was my control. I can have straight A's. I can control that. I can make these little guidelines for myself. I can never, ever, ever, you know, date anyone from my high school, period. And just create these strange little rules because I didn't have any rules. You know, there was no parenting or no guidelines. And so deviance is very confusing at that point. And I'm interested if you had this phase in your life or if maybe you have a child that is going through this phase or you know someone or have a friend, maybe you're a counselor or you're hearing the the testimony of someone or you're witnessing domestic violence and this is the perspective you're getting, the deviance, the acting out. And there's a lot of other red flags, this change that a victim goes through where they later become kind of the perpetrator, right? And there's always usually a prior history of domestic violence. So someone who is a child that's witnessed violence or who's been a witness to uh, violence in the home is usually a very big red flag. Also, possessive or obsessive or even jealousy issues. If someone really struggles with envy or OCD or possession, um, that can be a huge indicator of distrust, Do you associate violence with trust or control with trust? And you kind of start dissecting your definitions in your mind. Because when you say, I can't trust this person, or I can never trust men, or you can never trust women, or everyone's always cheated on me so I can never trust a partner, and you project that, trust has changed for you. And maybe you need to redefine it. Because really, it's just the ability to predict. And so we kind of dissect this person and and understand where obsessive comes from and where control comes from. Any police involvement, arguing, fighting, disturbance, criminal histories from the parents in the home, any drug arrests or substance abuse, any suicidal tendencies or depression, Almost always victims of domestic violence go through a suicidal phase, very depressed phase, and nothing helps. Medical intervention, therapy doesn't help. Nothing helps. Um, Maybe there's been protective orders in place at some point throughout this person's life. Um, These are all huge red flags to kind of let me know where you stand, what your perspective, what your experience is. What are you finding behind the closed doors in your mind as you go deeper and deeper and you double click and you listen to your intuition narrating for you when I say, what is domestic violence? That scenario. 
that you're thinking of, you can dissect it. So one of the interesting things about control as a person that is predatorial or self-destructive or someone who's addicted to domestic violence, they've been conditioned to be this way. It almost seems like the victim usually says, man, you never really know a person until you live with them, until you know what goes on. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes that's not. What do you think? Because what's unique about domestic violence is it's unlike any other crime. It can turn volatile like that. It can go from an exchange of words to physical violence. It can be either party. What's unique is statistics show us, depending on how you feel, what is your gender bias? What do you think of when you think domestic violence? Statistics shows us it's gender equal. When it comes to abuse, domestic violence being abuse in the home, it can be physical, it can be psychological, it can be sexual, it can be financial, it can be spiritual. Depending on your jurisdiction, it can include both parties engaging, someone being the perpetrator. They don't just arrest the woman that's screaming and crying saying, my husband did it. They arrest both parties immediately, which I love when jurisdictions do that because it's gender equal. But women typically struggle with psychiatric disorders, drug and alcohol abuse, Victimization, sexual, and psychological. But they're also usually the perpetrators of spiritual, financial, and verbal abuse. Whereas men are the perpetrators of sexual abuse and physical abuse. Psychopathy will start to include those who manipulate or charm and therefore are using psychological abuse as well. What does your scenario include? Is there any mental illness mixed in? Is there any medication? Is there any substance abuse? What's the social conduct? What do the neighbors think? What does society think? And it might be kind of strange to, again, think, well, this is kind of common sense, but if someone goes outside and kicks their dog out on the lawn over and over and over, and neighbors walk by and don't do anything about it, it's deemed socially acceptable and it can be reinforced. Versus if the neighbors socially reject that, call the Humane Society, take action, and the person faces a consequence, then suddenly they learn maybe this is not okay. You know, we can't assume always that people have the same ethical right and wrong that we do. So it's important to know our perspective. Is domestic violence wrong? Some would say an old folklore phrase, the rule of thumb, <laughs> comes from the fact that you're able to discipline your wife and children with anything the width of your thumb or smaller. That was the rule of thumb. And uh, there's some interesting sources online that suggest the truth of that or not. But in a lot of religious communities, Islamic communities, for example, um, it's okay to rape the homosexuality out of someone. If they at all see a woman, a young woman masturbating or engaging in incest or, uh, or a young child is engaging in any kind of homophobic activity, it's okay to rape that out of them. And that's socially okay. When in America, for example, our culture would say that's not okay. <laughs> that's not socially acceptable. Uh, our laws reflect that. Uh, we don't condone that behavior. And we see that as domestic violence. Maybe we don't always see financial as domestic violence. 
But have we not all experienced that? I can tell you my most recent brush with domestic violence, I'll give you a little intimate story again, is how the cycle again continued to change for me. I went from being very destructive, deviant, adrenaline junkie teenager to a woman in my 20s who was overcompensating. I realized I'd kind of had enough and I wanted to make my dad proud. I wanted to make up for my wrongdoings. You know, my ethical code was in there. And I felt shame. And I thought, you know, I can pick up these pieces. And I worked three full-time jobs and I, you know, graduated college and top of my class and was trying to make up for this, but I wasn't necessarily happy. And I got married to someone that, you know, my family loved and I wasn't happy. I did it because everyone else was doing it. You graduate college, you get married. You get married, you buy a house. You buy a house, you have babies. You have babies, you become PTA. I don't know. That's Southern thing. The milestones, you know, that we have in our mind. But I wasn't happy. And after we bought the house, I got to the milestone of ovarian cancer and I couldn't provide children. And I was told I could never be a mom. And I didn't know how to cope. And suddenly my comfort and my control, I I didn't know how to get control. You know, I couldn't control that I couldn't deliver children. And I didn't know how to respond. I'd never been taught well by my parents how to respond to stress. And um, neither had my husband. We were both very young. And um, he went off the deep end and so did I. And it ended in a very terrible divorce. And I became self-destructive. And I remember my mom once saying, man, when you destroy something beautiful like a marriage, sometimes you deserve to go through a shitty relationship. And that's unconsciously, I listened to her say that. That was her justification as we were hiding in the closet from Mike. (laughs) And here I was, 25 years old, crashing, and I did the same thing my mom did. I ended up in a relationship that was extremely violent. And I went through those red flags. Does this person have mental illness? Yes. Are they unstable? Yes. Are they financially abusing me? Yes. Are they spiritually abusing me? Yes. Are they physically abusing me? Yes. Are they psychologically abusing me? (laughs) Yes. Is there substance abuse present? Yes. Do they have a history? Yes. Had they witnessed violence? Yes. Uh, And common sense, I mean, I was a smart girl and I knew these things and my friends would see the black eyes and say what are you doing and I'd say I'm you know I couldn't be a good wife so hey why not just screw up you know I was going to do it 100% and I became very self-destructive I just went into the cycle again and what's interesting is both partners do engage in abusive behavior in a way you become a perpetrator because control is about creating chaos so maybe your perspective is Your mom was a victim to abuse or your sister was victim to abuse or you were a victim to abuse. Think about how in the abusive situation, control seemed to be the person doing the violence, right? As you're at the butt end of a gun looking down a barrel or you're huddled in the corner as someone's beating you with the broomstick, there's a level of control there and you don't have it. You know, if you're the person screaming stop, And that's not happening. You you don't have control. And so in a morbidly strange way, that cycle in our mental health or in our mental mind, that cognitive process, is to return to those scenarios but to flip the role. We've witnessed and conditioned ourselves to know what a perpetrator looks like and how they act. As a self-defense, you do that. Unconsciously, you're watching. And so in a lot of domestic violence cases, that's where the cycle changes. The victim becomes the perpetrator. And it can be a psychiatric disorder. It can be a way of self-defense or self-medication. A lot of times the additional self-medication for the pain or shame after you perpetrate is to self-medicate with drugs or alcohol. Um, And it's strange how that's, I mean, the cycle, it really does spin that way. But you still feel guilt, you know, and you know that it's wrong, but you're not always sure how to change it. 
But this is that opportunity right now in your mind, deep in your mind. You are aware of your perspective and how you feel about it and what scenarios you have. And you can flip a switch and turn off the light or you can take an eraser and you can erase out some of the things you don't love. Or you can even change the way you see it in color maybe and flip it to black and white. You can turn the volume down. And it doesn't have to affect you or be a trigger um, for anything in the future if you don't want it to be. So at some point there does has to be this change in the mind. For me, I remember sitting there you know, the second time having gone to the hospital. And I thought, you know, I'm turning into my mother. And I only knew how to be rebellious, and I could do that really well. So I said, okay, I'm going to be completely sober. I'm not going to socially drink. I'm going to work as a drug treatment counselor. I'm going to surround myself with positivity. And I'm going to change, and I'm going to not do anything like that. And F everyone right now. And I packed up what could fit in my car, and I changed out of rebellion. But also because of that rational decision that you have to get out of the circle. You have to turn left. You have to make the turn and you know it's going to be different and uncomfortable for a while, but you also know if you turn left, you don't have to have violence in your life anymore. There's actually a world that exists without violence. And I can tell you, it's been very difficult for me. My husband is the most patient and gentle and kind Scandinavian man. He's never said a negative thing in my direction. And I have tried to instigate it. <laughs> you know, when I'm having a really rough time, when my mom died, um, when I'm volatile or hormonal or whatever, freaking out. There have been times in the past where I tried to instigate an argument. And he just said, you know, I'm not doing it. And you have to change the way you communicate. It took me a long time to learn that I don't have to be putting other people down. Because my mom always did that. She was always the Simon in every conversation. And so that's where that obsession comes in, that compulsion, that OCD often is branching away from domestic violence because it's a way to establish control. It's a way to project control, that nitpicking. Sarah, make sure you do this. Make sure you do that. Make sure you do this. If company's coming over, you got to clean. You know, you got to match this with that. Um, that nitpicking, if you're an astrologer, maybe you call it the Virgo in me. Um, but that stems from somewhere in there. And what I love is maybe you're listening right now and the scenario that comes to mind when you hear domestic violence isn't anything extremely traumatic. Maybe it's something very minimal. But that's your trauma scale. So there's still triggers for you. There's still emotional attachments, associations. Your perception still matters very much. And so I'm interested if you've had intervention. Intervention for domestic violence, oftentimes it has to be something supported by the family, by a support system. It's really, really difficult to make the change and turn left, to, to break free from someone who, again, it's very common sense, but typically domestic violence, abuse in the home, is done by those we love. We deny it. We refuse to believe it. We believe in that person. We love that person. You know, my mom also had her good days. And so, 
there's conflict and intimacy and attachment. And making that change can be difficult, especially if it's a sexual partner, a financial partner. You know, that makes them an emotional partner. And when it is behind closed doors, physically abusive increases with intimacy as well. And they say that a quarter of the population will at some point in their life experience domestic violence. That's one in four people. That's a lot. So it's important to remember those red flags we had mentioned and to not be attracted to those and to avoid those. To consider yourself in the cycle and maybe considering that left turn. Knowing the outcome and wanting to change it or identifying risks for individuals and for perpetrators whether or not you're going to be the person needing an intervention or staging an intervention and not like intervention that you see on television but just giving help to someone giving them options sometimes that's extremely important so I'm interested for those of you joining me especially in the chat room um, how you feel, again, about the definition of domestic violence. How do you define it? Do you feel that it's masculine? That it's mostly physical? One of the most elusive and serious things about domestic violence is that those who are victim to it, the negative effects are very penetrating and it extends far beyond the abuse ceases. You think about it. It creeps into your nightmares. Or in my experience, for example, my son will, my three-year-old will punch his one-year-old brother in the face. And I'll reach down and want to grab his arm and say, what are you thinking? And for a moment, I'm fearful that violence is genetic, that that's my mother running through my veins and their veins and that I need to manage it more than other parents. Whereas someone else might just say, or maybe they just think, eh, it's normal. Brothers are forceful. It affects a core belief in me. That I know a lot of the theories of domestic violence that state that it is social. Or that it only happens in the lower class. But come on, we all know that's not true. It happens in every class and in every culture. Social conduct does influence it whether or not the neighbors are going to call the police or the person listening to the screams is ever going to call. In my most recent experience, and God, I hope he's listening, on New Year's, sat there and didn't call the police, that you know you are perpetrating it. You are instigating it. You are letting them know it's okay. And that's why it continued. So every perspective matters. Socially, I do believe that conditioning plays a large role. How do you condition violence? How do you discipline yourself or your children or your partner? How do you let them know something isn't okay when you're uncomfortable? Do you go on the defense? Do you recoil? Or do you engage in an argument? Do you recluse into a bath? and play the victim? How do you feel that it plays a role in you instigating it? And where is that line drawn? Because again, I think about the Situation Room, the show that um, airs before um, Mysteries of the Mind. And think about politically what's accepted, that uh, women were not even seen as you know, possible victims of intermarital rape until I think like the 70s. It's kind of crazy. Um, but laws reflect social acceptance and there seems to be a change there in how that plays out. Hollywood 
advertising. Usually it's the male portraying violence against women. But how did you define it? What has been your experience? This is that opportunity to make that change. So now you kind of unconsciously know these red flags. You understand intervention and you think about change. How much of violence can we change once we're already an adult? Once we're already at the age of enlightenment and we're thinking, ah, oh, okay, and we're having that reflection, that introspection of ourselves, that growth that tends to happen kind of in your early 30s when you're like, man, I'm not as hot and sexy as I was in my 20s and I've got to be a lot more responsible, but I'm ready to travel and see new things and, you know, you go through these changes. How does violence change? Can you change that? They say by the time you're 25, the gray matter, white matter in our brains is pretty well established and mature. Cognitive processes, those rivers in our mind, those software folders that we have to go to, those structures that are built without our control or input, they've been built for the past 25 years. And so they're pretty substantial and it's very difficult to change. Violence is one of those. So how does that branch grow in your tree? How does that folder look in your mind? What perceptions do you have? What bias do you have? Where is your ethical consideration? What's wrong? What's right? What's masculine? What's feminine? What's the victim? What's not? What's Stockholm Syndrome? Did you know that that's not even a recognized mental illness by the DSM-5? It's interesting to kind of consider that usually perpetrators of domestic violence are between the ages of 25 and 40. They are of the most intimate and are the relationships and they engage in multiple acts of abuse. It extends over a long period of time and there's a 54% return rate for the victim back to their perpetrator. Hmm. It's like it's a symbiotic relationship. I'm interested in your thoughts. I'm interested in your experiences with domestic violence, what has possibly helped you with treatment or in helping others that you've experienced uh, be a victim or perpetrator of domestic violence. I'm really interested in your stories. So feel free to join me on social sites such as Facebook uh, backslash the paranormal Sarah or Twitter at Paranormal Sarah, um, or you can check me out online if you just Google, double click, and explore. Um, kind of go deeper and deeper into the Google world of the matrix. Um, I assure you, you will find a way to connect with me, and I would love to hear your stories, and I would especially love to hear your feedback from today. Did you make any changes? How do you define it now? Learn more next week on Mysteries of the Mind with me, Sarah Soderland, here on Intrepid Radio.